The Mysteries of Mushrooms. I met this next speaker in 2018. She was just saying, with a great big energy around her, and I seen that very first off. We met in Mexico at the sacred mountain that Baba had taken us to, and she absorbed all of that energy that was already intrinsically there in the first place, but we just brought it forward. I've always called her Baba Kalindi's protege. When we speak of someone who is so divine, someone who is so blessed to be among us with the energy that she brings forth and the knowledge, you know that with her only being seven, she's like 107 from where she comes from and what she talks about. So I'm not gonna spend too much time up here going on and on and on about it because I could because when she starts to talk, y'all need y'all have y'all notes out, y'all phones on, y'all recorders, so you gonna learn something in this next hour. So I'm gonna bring to the stage right now this dynamic young goddess, Acacia. Village. 
This is taken as an excerpt and his words from a paper that he wrote called The Interdimensional Village. And I'm going to read this quote verbatim. The tiny spirit villages emerge from the Femto world where tiny sub-elementary particle worlds exist, where civilizations at scales so small they are now only being conceived of in science. These interdimensional villages are stepping stones to our reality. They model our reality, and the only villages on Earth that are found to be fractal are in Africa. Ron E. Glash writes of fractals, complexity, and connectivity in Africa, an understanding of the fractal culture enables an appreciation and the complexity of the mundane. The mundane indigenous artifacts. This singular understanding can act as a powerful motivator for rethinking modernity. So we're talking about artifacts that look simple, like a flint spear. But in order for the flint spear to be highly symmetrical and very sharp, there are certain things that have to take place for the human brain to evolve to a point to understand symmetry and artistry, and also to have an appreciation for the finer aspects of what we consider to be mundane indigenous artifacts, whether that's spears, arrowheads, uh, whether that's an axe or a, mat a matate. For these things to be invented, they had to first be visualized and conceived in the human mind, and we know that entheogens are exceptional at helping us what? Visualize. All right? So I have an analogy. I've been on the beach in Mazunte. I live in Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, where Baba Kalendi first uh, took us to food of the gods on the sacred mount mountain. Um, of the Sierra Madre region of Southern Oaxaca. When I'm not in California, that's where I live. And I was sitting at the ocean eating the psilocybin ceruleescence that Maria Sabina also herself enjoyed eating in Huala de Jimenez, which is some hours away from where I live, but the same mushroom grows because we are in the same lo locale region of Oaxaca. You can sense how brave someone must be to dive into the ocean where there is no horizon and the dangers contained wherein. Once you're in the ocean, not trusting her isn't an option. The mushroom, to me, is very similar to the ocean. There are many people who dive in deep and are able to pull back some of the most beautiful artifacts and exotic treasures. And there are some people who stay closer to the beach who also find exotic treasures but more coincidentally. And when we look at the ocean on the mushroom, when you eat the mushroom on the ocean, something that stuck out to me in one of Baba Kalindi's early lectures was about his experience taking mushrooms at the Kahuna Beach, where the Kahuna Graveyard was in South Point in Hawaii. This is an area that's an ancestral beach. What does it mean to have a place where you roll your ancestors' flesh out to sea? What does it mean to have entheogens as a part of ritual when you are giving honor to your ancestors as they are being uh, released from the physical and transmuted back to the earth? There's something very special about ancestral beaches. I went ahead and put this video here. I'm going to play it for you. And I want you guys to observe this as I'm speaking. So this is in Mazunte. There's an archway where you can see the water coming up through. And this is where the dead, uh, the Mayans, will be left and the, the riptide is so strong that it will break your body in two, it will break your bones in an instant. Many people go out there, maybe 20 feet to go swimming, but after 20 feet, everybody knows that impending doom is awaiting you. And this is a place where the sacred mushroom grows really nearby, very close, like a half hour away, the Mayans utilized the sacred mushroom and ritual, not just on the mountain, but also on the beach, in honor of their ancestors who were becoming deified. And deification is something that a lot of people have misconstrued due to Western dualism. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later. But deification to the Aztecs was if God or we're not, we're not even going to use the word God. Teotl is the actual word, or teot. 
If Teot is the rain and the wind and the trees and the forest and the stones and the mountain top, then to become deified means to become one with everything that is, all that is. And when we take the mushroom and we go out and sail on this ocean of the multiverse, when we catch waves, etc., we can start to begin to find patterns in the energies that come up for us. Sometimes you can find a good groove. Sometimes you can sail and find yourself thought form after thought form creating a ship to cut through the waters. And rather than running against the waves, which isn't a great idea if you're at the open sea, you start creating thought forms that keep you afloat. And those thought forms are oftentimes having to do with faith in oneself, faith in one's inner deity, faith in God inside of yourself to help keep you afloat. Inside of the human, we have many varying genetic signatures. These genetic signatures were expressed as the jaguar, as the falcon, as the lion, in many different societies. What's interesting about the mushroom is that it gives you a, a denser amount of axons for the brain to communicate from left to right hemisphere. So the corpus colostrum is what is responsible for becoming stronger as a result of you taking the mushroom. More connections are literally being made. So it's possible that you can connect to what's inside of your DNA before you ever became a human. In your evolutionary tree, there's 42 other animals that are also a part of your evolution as a human being that you can connect into. The intelligence of those animals is contained within your physical form. The destinations beyond the Planck length and the Planck scale are destinations that look otherworldly, very futuristic, that are composed of holographic light energies. And when you go to these destinations, you may find that consciousness is powering the whole thing. Because the smaller you get below the atom, the closer and closer you get to what we consider to be the underworld. And also to realms of legend, they call pure lands or locas. So just like the great Ahati Kalindi'i who explored the subparticle and the comedic realms of Dubai, the Dawat is a place that is talked about in Kemet that is the triple thick darkness under the Planck scale, triple thick darkness. Baba Kalindi is not the only quantum explorer. There have been quantum explorers before Baba Kalindi, like Papa Zimbabwe, who was where Doctor Strange was based upon in the first place. Guru Rinpoche was none other than the original quantum physics explorer. He didn't just theorize, he experienced. And this is what Baba Kalindi did as well. That's why I said the great Ahati Kalindi E. Because quantum exploration has more than one purpose. When you hear someone's name, after they've been to the quantum scale, their name possesses energy. They have access to the subparticle places that they've been. And those places are places of power and of legend. So going to the subparticle scale isn't just for you to be able to say, oh, well, I went past the fractals. No, when someone sees your face, your signature looks different. The molecular makeup of who you are should be changed. So that's when you have to tell somebody. You can see it. You become all attractive. People become attracted to you. And that attraction is so that you can help in the vessel of light to help that person forward. Some people do bad things with that light. Some people who become attractive, who call themselves a shaman or a guru, etc., abuse that power. And we're very familiar with it when it's abused, but when it's being used properly, we like to ignore the fact that someone possesses power. Baba Kalendi called the mushroom the sacred power plants. It's a picture of Papa Zambab. We can see how his likeness was borrowed for the creation of Doctor Strange, which is interesting. 
But one of the teachings from Padma Sambhava to the Dakinis is very important. And I want you to listen to Bhakti Clinton's lectures very clearly because he told me something one time in private. I was having some trouble with my ex. I went over to him, I was like, wow, oh, man, I'm just having some trouble, you know. I, I, I didn't even think of it as, as a big thing. I was like, well, you know, this guy's giving me trouble. And he looks at me, he looks me directly in the eyes. He said, be like water falling into water. I was like, what's that supposed to mean? Like, you're not supposed to, you're not, you're not, you're not, you know, super, like, I've never heard you say anything like that. And then when I started listening to his lectures, there were a collection of teachings inside of his lectures that were organic and unique to him. The only way out is through. I'm gonna go deeper into the darkness and wait for my eyes to adjust to the darkness so I can go deeper into the darkness. These were principal teachings that he possessed. And so when I read this teaching from Padma Sambhava, he said, when you have understanding, free from accepting and rejecting, after knowing how to condense all the teachings into one single vehicle, then your dharma practice becomes the real dharma. When in any practice you do you possess refuge and bodhisattva, and have unified the stages of development and completion and means and knowledge, then your dharma becomes the real path. When you combine the path with the view, meditation, action, and fruition, then your path clarifies confusion. And when you exert yourself in practice, having fully resolved the view and meditation, then your confusion can dawn as wakefulness. In any case, no matter what practice you do, Failing to unify development and completion, view and conduct, means and knowledge will be like trying to walk on just one leg. And that's very true in my experience with the mushroom. Some of us, we trying to do too much. We have multiple identities. There's an identity crisis amongst our people of what I is, what ego means, what divinity is, what gods we are, where we came from who we are and where we're trying to go. And a true path is clearer from confusion. So eliminating the confusion could help us to organize ourselves better. And when we're organized, some magic starts to take place. Transformation. In addiction to practicing Pavasambhava, many modern teachers highly recommend the Hayagriva in difficult modern times. Let's talk about coronavirus, for instance. I know a handful of psychonauts who ate mushrooms and went in and conquered the entity that was coronavirus by assuming a form that was a personality of divinity that was fearsomely wrathful, wrathfully compassionate. These images aren't meant to be disturbing, but they still Sometimes are, a little bit disturbed me. Like, oh, that looks scary. I want to run the other direction. Well, that's the point. Because there are certain things that will come up, like disease and sickness and sickness of mind, that you must take the wrathful form of the supreme being inside of yourself and stand in your power to remove it. There's one brother amongst us who we didn't trip together, but we've had similar trips. He's a brother who has inspired me in a very high degree, and he works with one of the five celestial kings, five Buddhist kings, which are personalities of the supreme, faces of the supreme, names of the supreme. Akayalanatha. And Kayalanatha is a form of the Buddha that is wrathfully compassionate and carries a flaming sword. And this flaming sword can cut through ignorance. It can cut through grief. It can cut through violence internally. It is a dharma weapon, meaning it's not violent, it's compassionate. It transforms ignorance into wisdom when it works. And there are martial systems that are associated with it that are Tibetan. So this example is a yidam. So a lot of you guys do yidam work and don't know it. How many of you guys have studied the comedic sciences? Raise your hands. 
So if you've ever studied the comedic sciences and you've ever struck a pose left foot forward, that's a yidam. When you say, I am your root victorious over set, that is a yidam. A yidam is a divine personality. And many of us in our development have evolved from divine personality to personality. But what's interesting to me is that Islam is the only religion that outlaws Allah being personified as anything other than infinity itself in the fractals inside of the mosques. It outlaws personification. And I think that in many ways, if you are not an adept, you can get confused and go through an identity crisis. That's strictly because you think that you're something other than the supreme. So you become dual-minded, and that's what we call ego, is that second person you're having a conversation with in your head all day long that shouldn't be there. So can you access infinity? The space inside the atom is just that empty space. This is science. You go look up what's inside an atom, this is the answer you get from scientific articles. The space inside an atom is empty space, a vacuum. Air molecules are also made up of atoms, with a central core of nucleons and electrons spinning around them. They too have empty space between their nucleons and electrons. So we know that we're made of what? In science, at least. That's what we're told in, in kindergarten and well, high school now. <laughs> The word emptiness is best known for its central place in the heart sutra of the Mahayana tradition. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form is no other than emptiness, emptiness is no other than form. Exploring infraparticle intelligence requires you to understand the basic fundamental laws of what you're exploring. I think a lot of us get so caught in the word infraparticle, we think about it so hard, we forget that we encounter it more than other thing that we will encounter in this reality. So the Aztecs made it, went ahead and made it simple for us. They gave us an entire system of education, social work, farming, fertility, culture that was all based on the only thing that will never be lost, the atom. You can burn down a library. You can destroy stone tablets. But you can't get rid of all the matter in between. That's impossible. So where on earth would they have seen something that resembles atoms containing electrons and nucleons exactly? Where would they have seen a symbol that looked almost identical to what we consider to be an atom and its behavior? And its behavior is important because Edward O. Seller, this is in the book Aztec Philosophy by James Matthew. If you don't already have this book, write it down. Aztec Philosophy, written by James Matthew of the University of Maryland. Edward Seller defines Olin as movimiento rodante, rolling movement, or as I prefer, rolling and change, which is something that we, when we do martial arts, we're doing Rolling motion change. A lot. Especially if you've ever seen Bob Kalindi do the circle. That's based on the, the motion of the galaxy. They have an entire school that's based on this one principle. Schools, thousands of schools. The Nahuay Olin is a concept in Aztec Mexica cosmology with a variety of meanings. Nahui translates to four. Olin translates to movement or motion. Olin was primarily portrayed in Aztec codices as two interlaced lines, which are each portrayed with two center, central ends. Nahui Olin has been used as an education framework, particularly in social justice and ethical studies. So since Olin is a part of Teoto, or the motion that Teoto makes when it moves, what is Teoto? Is it God or energy? So I'm gonna pause right there and tell y'all a story real quick. I was at Malinalco in the eagle's nest where the jaguar knights, eagle knights of legend, went through their mushroom initiations in Mexico. Malinalco is a very, very beautiful place. It's a pyramid that's built into a high mountain range. 
Some of the people in this very room came with me, and we visited. And while we were there, we got an invitation to go to a meditation, which was an Arcturian meditation by the elders of the town to connect with the Arcturian race. And what's interesting to me about that is that when we meditated together, we all saw the same thing without the mushroom. When they called down the little black boxes that were part of the ships to absorb the toxic energy, how is it that we saw the same energy in the same time frame being transmuted real time by ourselves? Well, at the end of this meditation, an elder pulls me aside and says, can you read stones? Can you speak to the stones? Someone said you can speak to stones. I'm like, well, okay. I'll give it a shot. I got a stone that Mama Delaney gave me. I work with it. So he goes out beyond the counter, pulls this thing out, and he's covering it up. He puts it in my hands, says, close your eyes and hold this, and then tell us what it tells to you. And I said, okay. So I held it, and I was holding it in my arms, in my hand, and it was about the size of my hand, a little bit bigger, like a small football. It was made of clay. And I accidentally moved it up a little bit. As soon as I moved it up, a light form hit me. And I was like, that's not normal. So I kind of shook it from side to side. And there was something making sound inside of it. I was like, okay. And then the light form came from the side. And I saw a point. And then I, I shook it again. And every time I shook it, it made the image denser to where if I shook it for a long moment of time, I kept seeing the old end figure coming out, but it had rooms inside of it. One room was the room of childbirth and fertility. One room was the room of maize. One room was the room of, of jaguar warriors and eagle warriors. One room was the room of the children. And in the middle, it was like uh, seeing the, the Aztec sun face. And I asked him, I said, well, I think that the, what this is called, I had to Google it later and make sure I wasn't crazy. I see, I see Olin. And he said, yes, what does it mean? And he's asking me this in Spanish. So in my broken Spanish, I say, well, I see mujeres y niños y hombres cultivar maíz. My, my Espanol is not that good. And he said, yes, tell us more. So I just told my friend, who spoke good Spanish, like, can you translate for me? He's like, yeah. He's like, well, I see women and children giving, uh, women giving birth. I see women planting corn. I see traditions. I don't know if I'm going crazy. You just handed me this. I still haven't looked at what it is. He said, now look at it. And I look at it, and there's a baby in the center, Olmec, that looks like our faces, same, same type of structure, but a longer skull. And it had, uh, two parents with elongated heads on both sides. He said, this is 5,000 years old. This is an artifact that we took back from Mount Alban that was dug up in a farm field. We've never had anybody be able to translate for us what the meaning is of this. And this is correct. Do you know what this is? I said, well, it looks like it was built for children. I don't know. It's got a rabbit to it. I think of a kid's toy. I say, exactly. This is what was given to our youth when they were born. And when they shook it, it would take them into a trance state. There are seeds of a sacred plant inside the stone. And when the child throws on the ground and breaks it, then the same plant that we use to create this object will grow again. That's technology. experiences. The sacred mushroom opens the floodgates to the realm beyond the illusion of ordinary life. The only reason you think your life is ordinary is because you haven't been able to appreciate the mundane on that high of a level. There's going to come a day where you wake up in the morning and do something as simple as kissing your partner after you've been in this work for a long time, and it's going to be like standing at the throne of the Most High. And you're going to look into her eyes and you're going to see the wisdom of the cosmos flood into your body, into your consciousness. 
When she makes you tea in the morning, that tea is a highly complex technological formula of love that has been imbued with healing powers based on her incantations and words that she spoke around it for you. When you go to sleep at night, you're laying next to another divine being who can help you with your innermost thoughts and needs. This is a reality for some of us, but for other people, they haven't woken up to realize that the gifts are in the gratitude. It's how thankful you are. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It's if you appreciate the energy, then it's going to behave differently. They're going to add to it. So to the Aztecs, teok is very polysemic. Polysemic means it has a number of meanings, interpretations, or understandings. This is one of them. What is the non-dual monotheistic phenomenon of Teotl? Many Nahuatl scholars are upset with the current Judeo-Christian uh, labeling of the forced Teotl as a god. The increasingly widespread animosity towards the doctrine of Catholicism imposed by the Spaniards in 1519 when they went on a conquest eliminating trees and all human superstitions from the Aztec people. The idea was of using the word God of the Judeo-Christian doctrine to refer to Yodel seems far-fetched. However, it's not entirely incorrect because this is what they think of as Teot. Teot can be something like a dressing room, a place, or even a stone. It's called an ancestor, but it can be the rain, the moon, all at the same time. It is said that we have ancestors that give us life, the culture of the heart, the face, and when they die, they are ele elevated to the position of Teot, which is the great and zero. And the great and zero is a, con is, is a concept that's not just Aztec, it's also Buddhist and Tibetan. Also, it's non-dual um, when it's doing its work. It becomes deified because they are now one with the rain, the moon, and the stone. And that's the Mayan definition of Teot, an energy and motion that is composed of all living things. And said so quantum physics is indeed very much agreement with the Buddhistic emptiness when it comes to Teot. So, being great and zero, what do you think of when you say everything exists and also nothing exists? Well, if we look at the definition of the atom, that's true. If everything's composed of something that's empty, then how could it also not be nothing? It's also, it's gotta be both. When it's in motion, it's nothing. When it's acting, it's something, it's everything. In the paradigm of quantum physics, there is ceaseless change at the core of the universe. In the paradigm of Mahayana wisdom, too, there is ceaseless change at the core of the consciousness and the universe. And so the mysteries of the personalities of good, of God, the forces of nature and within ourselves, we're, we're living under a term called ego. Freud coined the term ego. What existed before the word I became ego. Ego, it means I, or I am. The idea that I is a separation from God is a Western dualistic idea. You're, you're living with a hypothesis, saying that my ego died. The ego didn't do nothing, it just realized what it actually was. In the terms of Aztec philosophy, it became non-dual. When you remove the dualism of the other voice and you shed that secondary voice, then you become one, I, one mind, and you become connected to all things. It's the separation of that secondary force that sometimes takes over that is the ego. So what's dualism? Mind and body are separate, non-identical entities. What's monism? Mind and body are manifestations of a single substance. Monism is compatible with religions and cultures like Sufism and Islam where it is said, la ilaha illallah, this means there's no other god than Allah, but also another translation could be, possibly, there is no other reality but Allah. So mind and body could possibly be manifestations of a single substance. So here's a quote from my biblical studies. This is from James 1 and 8. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. This sounds like a mushroom saying to me. That's why I quoted it. Because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So double-mindedness is what the term was before ego was created, to say your spiritual double. In the Ivory Coast in Africa, the spiritual double is still talked about. And I have it in my slides. This is an African concept. This is also a, a, a Christian concept, shall we say. But it's not new. Having a double mind is the mind of doubt. When you are about to take your mushrooms, and that little voice in your head says, oh, you're gonna poison yourself, you ate too much. Uh, do you really wanna do that right now? You got something to do later. That's the second voice because you're, it's commanding you now. How'd that happen? How'd you make up a voice in your head that now is in command and control of your emotions? That's called double-mindedness. And when you eliminate that doubt and that fear, you can identify the spiritual double that is cast into the underworld of Aztec legend as the lower part of your higher self. Steps toward organizing ourselves. There's an education model that's entirely based on the principles and philosophy of those who explored psilocybin in early history. Aztec philosophy, poetry, Sufic philosophy, Vedic philosophy, Taoist philosophy are all compatible with the psilocybin mushroom. Even all religions are as well. Even religions you don't agree with. How do we extract the lessons from these ancient and modern philosophers and integrate their experience into our mushroom practices in a way that gives all students and avid learners a chance to deepen their experience through traversing novel states of consciousness as a form of self-education? What is self-education model? The philosopher's guide to magic mushrooms is a possibility. What if there was a time where you decided that you were going to eat the mushroom and then read the philosophy of your elders for yourselves and see if the most high within yourself could find fault with it. That is a time where you are no longer taking someone else's words for it. You are experiencing the philosophies of the past, improving them and building upon them with more truth. It's a new form of education that the mushroom can help bring forward. Here are the benefits of taking the mushroom. The ingestion of psychedelic plants favors the emergence of sharing of information. We've spent too long being secretive. Group mentality. We've spent too long glorifying individualism to the point that now we are so separate that it's very difficult to find one single person that we can be on a common spectrum with. Animism. Seeing the spiritual in all things, like our ancestors did. Pro-social leadership. Collective ritual and synchronicity, i.e. laughter, music, and dance. Where'd that all go? So when your cognition is enhanced, these are things that are favored. When your sociality is enhanced and communication and social learning is enhanced, these are things that are favored in the emergence. This is from studies in the UK. This is niche, con niche, niche uh, construction, gene culture, uh, co-evolution. And right now we're in a co-evolutionary phase. So it's really important that we allow ourselves to get more organized inside of this and form more of a group mentality, find out what we can agree with more than what we can. Overcoming current issues. Understanding a practical structure for mushroom use. What is practical? That means when it comes to martial arts, dance, smithing, jewelry making, artistry, architecture, education, social values, philosophy and leadership, these are all things that we can gain from working with the mushroom. If we have elders who are working with the mushroom as an integral guide so uh, their students can experience firsthand their lessons, understand the lessons from different modalities of motion, mushroom consumption. 
And also understand the ocean analogy. If you're scuba diving without equipment, and you get in deep sea treasures versus what's found on shore, not being afraid to go deep and find the treasures. Once you eliminate the dual aspect of your mind, it becomes extraordinarily clear what it is that you're here to do. You're here in service to yourself. When you are going in on the mushroom at high dose, and you are fighting demons, and you're going through your own healing process, you're doing so not just for yourself, but for the collective. You're eliminating a toxic energy from the collective. And that is something you can do in service to your community. I don't know how many times I've tripped at, or I've seen somebody next to me who was going through a trip having a hard time. When they eliminated that energy that was chasing them and stalking them, the people who they were talking to in the community who were having problems stopped having problems because of the energy that they were bringing that was disruptive. Healing yourself is the mission here. Overcoming your fear, anxiety, addiction, and pandemic mentality and being two steps ahead of society and practicing self-awareness is a worth it reward for doing the work. Education, Tetzkatli Polka. In the educational framework, Tetzkatli Polka represents self-reflection, silencing the distractions and obstacles in our lives in order to become intellectual warriors. Going into the cave, as my friend Tyler said, a process to regain the historical memory at the individual and community collective levels, which leads to individual and community liberation. This is a foundational value that came from the mushroom. But first you gotta understand what your brain can do, because before you can do all that fancy stuff, you first have to understand what it means to build connections outside of the 3D. A lot of people say, well, can handle here. So what are you gonna do with over there? Since you can't handle your, your regular life, can't make your bed, have bad trouble with your relationships, what do you do when eating mushrooms take you out of this reality? You're just trying to escape. People will try to say that. So what does it mean to build neuronal connections in other dimensions? And what purpose does it have to go super deep into the ocean? Here's the psilocybin and the corpus colostrum. This is from G. Petrie et al. 2014. There's an increase in integration between cortical regions and the psilocybin states. One possible byproduct of this is greater communication across the whole brain, which is the phenomenon of synesthesia, which is often reported in conjunction with the psychedelic state. How many of you guys have tasted smells on mushrooms? How many of you guys have been looking at the floor moving and felt something inside of yourself also moving with it? You, you, the brain starts changing. The increased integration across the whole brain builds a thicker corpus colostrum. This is the human brain of Einstein. I'll show you what a thick corpus colostrum looks like. The findings show that Einstein had more extensive connections between certain parts of the cerebral hemispheres. Anybody ever seen Einstein sticking his tongue out with a tab of LSD on it? Yeah, he was a friend of Yogananda as well. He did the work. Albert Einstein had colossal corpus colostrum stretching nearly the full length of the brain from behind the forehead to the nape of the neck. The corpus colostrum is a dense network of neuronal fibers that make brain regions with very different functions work together. We need more new theories of relativity, if you ask me. This is what in ancient Kemet the corpus colostrum looked like, was the monocled cobra. The monocled cobra is also a representation of what the corpus colostrum looks like, as well as the eye of Horus, the midbrain cross-section. So a symbolization we can see here, having a larger corpus colostrum, having it spread all the way from here all the way to the nape of the neck, could be part of the scientific system of ancient Kemet. So the technology of us, right now, DNA has recently been used as a programmable smart building block for the assembly of wide range nanostructures. I have a hypothesis. My hypothesis is that indigenous people of the Shipibo tribe in Peru have already beat us to learning how to program DNA utilizing ayahuasca. And also other tribes who practice weaving as well are also symbolizing 
the DNA and RNA working together because this appears to be mictly, or what is called woven energy in Aztec philosophy. The same patterns that we're seeing when they are incorporating RNA and making structures artificially. It says, herein we describe a simple general strategy for the de novo design of nanostructures inside the self-assembly of RNA strands which are programmed by DNA strands. Quantum coherence is part of that property. When you look in the bottom right, we see a Shapibo Ikaro blanket which looks almost identical to the structures that they're artificially building to create a better human being. In the past 10 years, a variety of different studies have shown a probable coherence, tunneling and entanglement in the cellular biological environment, making coherence a conceivable mechanism for coordination of oscillating neurons. So to put that in plain speech, there's a entanglement between the neurons that are actually on a subparticle level that make up your DNA. And there's a coherence and tunneling and entanglement that makes it easy for the oscillating neurons to coordinate with each other. So they work together. So they're also building DNA-based rotors, many machines in motion made of your DNA. Once pinned, the motor had to rotate the helix to get from one base to the next. So they're already building small machines out of your DNA on that small level. So what makes us think that our work with plant medicine is much different when we have these moments of realization where we're traveling deep into our DNA and we're moving traumatic aspects. We're doing our own gene editing, consciously utilizing the mushroom. So we've got molecule-sized propellers. This is part of the search for infraparticle uh, intelligence. They're using DNA origami to create art, deliver drugs to cells, and study the immune system. If you have two complementary strands of DNA, they zip up. That's what they do. So when one strand is altered to complement a strand and a different helix, they can find other strands that zip up instead, creating new structures. And then they phase lock. So that's when synchronized neurons that are distant start to sync up to each other and being triggered by electrical pulses. Have you ever been on the mushroom and you start feeling the electrical pulses going through your body and it's almost as if you're starting to feel yourself crystallize. You're starting to feel yourself align on polarity that is such that all of the molecules in your hands and your feet, etc., start to communicate with each other. This communication process is what they call synchronized pulsing, or phase lock, in physics. So, what happened to the previous civilizations if they had this technology? The Younger Dryas event happened about 14,500 uh, years ago. And we have this rich layer of carbon-rich deposits. Carbon contains a lot of information. It's one of the oldest elements that we have access to. My theory is, just like in Africa, when you're initiating the certain systems, black powder is tapped into your skin and it's also found in the water supply, etc. is that when you're eating the mushroom, at the end, at the beginning of starting over after a cataclysm, you have this amazing opportunity to travel into these carbon-rich deposits and retrieve information that has been stored on a subparticle level. There's no better vault than something that is not accessible materially. Can you imagine a storage system so efficient that it keeps all the information organized even if you blow it up with a nuclear bomb? That is atomic level and Planck length level storage. And if we look at the nano diamonds, the nano diamond shapes mirror other sacred structures that we see. The nano diamonds are organized, and if we were to go even smaller, which we can't because we don't have the technology to go even smaller, I'm sure we could explore entire realms. So crystals are a technology to communicate with infraparticle intelligence. Scientists at the University of Darmstadt in Germany have stopped light for one whole minute. For one whole minute, light, which is usually the fastest known thing in the universe, travels 300 million meters per second, was stopped dead inside of a crystal. 
This effectively creates light memory, where the image being carried by the light is stored in the crystals. And you can do this with silicone dioxide as uh, storing information, just like a hard drive. So when we say the search for particle intelligence, or SIPI that Bob McClendy E talked about, the hyperintelligences that are a billion years older than our universe have probably downgraded themselves or downloaded themselves to achieve hugely greater performance levels. The smaller you get, the faster you get. Whole civilizations may be living inside volumes the size of nucleons or smaller. And this is a quote directly from the science of self-realization. It said, with a single particle of myself, Krishna, I maintain the entire creation. With a tiny particle of himself, Krishna creates and maintains millions of universes. And Krishna is just the personality of the Supreme. And in the Rig Veda, it talks about the same thing. Shiva is described in Tantra books as one who is anapuruva, stiti, or pre-atomic. In pre-atomic stage, an unstable atom has an excess electron or proton, and this means Shiva exists in the form of atomic energy which flows, and these atoms make up molecules which appear like matter, but they appear to be matter. They're also empty. So there are innumerable particles, it said, this is in the science of self-realization, talking about Hare Krishnaism and many different other sects of Hinduism, but the mushroom was a central part of that. And this is the mushroom being shown in Cambodia. Because we have no instrument to measure the dimensions of the spirit soul, the small particle of spirit soul is measured in this way. In other words, the soul is so small, it's smaller than the atom. The particle within you, within me, within the elephant, within gigantic animals, in the men, in the ant, in the tree, everywhere. How small is an atom? An atom is one and thousand times smaller than the thickest human hair. It has on average a diameter of one times ten to the negative ninth in diameter. So when you're traveling the world beneath the plank length, you may encounter a man with four arms, holding an, uh, a conch, just like Bob McClendy said a really long time ago. You may encounter many different infraparticle personalities as you get closer and closer and smaller and smaller in your journey into yourself. And to put that technology to use so that you can have a ship to travel the multiverse, the high seas with, in order to space travel, one does not need to create a very complex and sophisticated machine like the Vimanas that we see. But you can create a vehicle out of its own energy. When we see an extraterrestrial spaceship up in the sky, most of the time it is not physical as it appears to be, it's plasma. When a ship enters into the atmosphere in the stratosphere, it takes on a physical manifestation, but most are made of thought forms. The psilocybin mushroom is the ideal technology to create these thought forms and build with them from amphor particle into this reality. And if you don't remember, even people like Dennis McKenna have written books about hyperdimensional light ships. This is not a new concept. It's a lost art. How do you make a hyperdimensional light ship? You can do it with a bunch of people gathered on a Saturday night, or you can do it by yourself. But it takes the visualization and learning the positions to place your body in that are ideal to you traveling interdimensionally. If you study different Aztec uh, statues, you'll find positions that look like somebody's about to go bobsled. The guy's got his head caught to the right, his hand is down, his knees are bent, he's about to go somewhere. That is a position that's an ancient position or yoga for interdimensional space travel. Meaning you got a screen in front of you showing you where you're going inside the trip. You got car doors. I've had interdimensional space cars that look like Jaguars, but inside, it's like, it's like a Jaguar car. You ever seen the Jaguar brand of vehicles that has a really sleek uh, Jaguar insignia? Well, imagine if they did it like Gucci and just had that tiny little symbol replicated 20,000 times and had interdimensional fabric that looked like velvet, but it's made of holographic material. You can have some really sweet rides. The crystal rides make Mercedes Benz look lame. The tradition
conditions in Africa and the mushroom are really hard to find. Why is it really hard to find? Because it's secret. And it's kept secret on purpose. But this is something that I can share that's not so secret. This is from the Ivory Coast. This is talking about a confrontation that a shaman had, and a shaman, but a shaman's patient had with his spiritual double. So the confrontation with my double was a confrontation with myself. Who here can relate to those words? When you've seen yourself and your shadow, well, I'm gonna call it a double. One day it will be decisive. Nevertheless, the Arthur eats Tamu, which is the name of it in the Ivory Coast, Tamu. In the same situation, the experience appears more constructive. In a dialogue between the author and the healer, at a certain point, the latter affirms, Tamu is the mushroom of knowledge of oneself and of others, and his famous power lies in this trip. And this is a conicide that grows in the Ivory Coast. A lot of you guys will be asking me, like, what psilocybin mushroom grows in Africa that has a traditional use? Well, it actually turns out there are quite a few, but they're not written about. They're identified, but they're not written about. But there are conocybes that do contain psilocybin that have traditional uses. And this is from Suleiman, the healer of the power plants, 1992, published in Paris. Tamu, the mushroom of knowledge, growing in lagoonal areas, in compact groups, on the rises in the ground. Suleiman, bargaining the cost of money each time, disclosed other vegetables having extraordinary magic and healing properties. Used in the treatment of external and internal hemorrhages, plants to see at night, plant of the little immortality. That's how plants were named when the mushroom was helping the identification process to take place. So Suleiman even draws the attention to the plant of cotton, first class regulator of the central nervous system. It's said to be an ideal mild drug. It gives a peaceful euphoria, a calm and light elation. How do we not know this about the plant cotton? That is euphoric. So when you take the mushroom and you eat a plant, its effects are magnified to the point that the plant spirit is able to be communed with, truly. I had a really wonderful conversation with a brother right here about the Rishi. He was telling me about his experience taking psilocybin with Rishi, and I was so excited because we need more healers to step up their relationship with the plant intelligences in order to call themselves true healers. Because in the indigenous paradigms, you would have to be initiated by eating the mushroom so that you as a healer knew how to properly collect plants. But we want to pretend like that's not a part of our own initiatory practices. It is. And I say R because I have ancestors from the Ivory Coast. So definitely part of mine. So the mushroom has an exploratory tool. It could be astonishing that a traditional African healer talks about the system of the central nervous system, never been to college, never been to high school, never read an anatomy book, but he's able to describe what's going on. And furthermore, biotypes, molecules, cytological effects. These are the maps, by the way. These are the maps of the Ivory Coast. They have some of the most elaborate maps in the entire uh, area of Africa that all have mushroom symbolism to some degree. The dome-shaped mushroom is a further confirmation of the strangeness of this reported event. Scientists don't know how to explain how indigenous African healers can look into somebody's body and see their electrical nervous system firing. They can see the blue light coming out of the meridian points of the skin, just like an ayahuasca or cuaderno in Peru who can look at your body under the influence of ayahuasca and virtually perform an x-ray using Icaro sound waves to reach into the physical body and to look beyond the flesh into the bones and see where there is sickness. I've had this experience myself, singing to my partner on the psilocybin mushroom. The sound waves were bouncing off of things that should not be in the human body, like tumors or blockages or inflammation it would come back to me in my vision like a bat making a sound. So here's a Dallas quote from Dr. Jerry Allen Johnson.
awesome because I want you guys to be grounded in practicality here. It is an accepted fact that in ancient magical practices that the mind is not generated by the physical brain. Rather, the mind is viewed as something above and beyond the physical body that is aware of reality at a far deeper level than most individuals' experiences. The brain simply acts as a reducing valve. You're getting fried with so much information from the cosmos when you eat the psychedelic mushroom. When you eat the sacred mushroom, the visions that you get are just its way of reducing what all information is entering you. It's filtering out those impressions that are not currently useful for everyday survival. That's what the brain does. It's a filter. Psychedelic substances such as psychedelic plants and many spiritual disciplines, including those that incorporate deep meditational states, all assist the individual in reducing the efficiency of the brain as a filter. So when you start eating the mushroom, you start squeezing out the filter. You're like, oh, whoa, why is that there? That's dirty. Oh, why am I thinking this? You're like, okay, well now that I'm not a filter, what am I? Now I've got empty space that I can fill with light and love and harmony. Once you start clearing out space, you start deciding what goes in your brain. This allows more energetic impressions of the mind at large to be really received. Far from being hallucinatory, these energetic impressions are experienced by sorcerers as indirect glimpses of reality. Indirect glimpses of reality flowing into the mind at a level that individual cannot normally access. This is the Taoist understanding, as a thou several thousand years, 80th generation understanding of what the psilocybin mushroom's purpose is. So I had a question from a student of Baba Kalani from South Africa come in this week. He asked me, our relationship with fungus is closer than our relationship with plants. And that's true, we're partially fungus. So that could somewhat implicate that there are renditions of the multiverse in which we were, are, or, or were fully integrated with the fungus on a DNA and consciousness level. What would the possibility be that the terraformation and destruction of our Mother Earth is a form of warfare against humanity to prevent us from fully integrating with the fungus? Is it possible that a species or multiple species formed an alliance against humanity's future state, time traveled into this particular rendition of the humanity's evolution, and constructed this matrix, which in turn decided to destroy the planet, which destroys the organic technologies which exist on Gaia to aid our evolution? And how do we lay the groundwork for future integration into the organic technologies? So how do we actually connect with the fungus as a tool for eliminating the filter that is causing us to be blind to ourselves and to have voices that are in control of our minds that are not in alignment with source? How do we do that? And is our relationship, since it's closer to the fungi, what does it look like when we start being symbiotic with it, when we start functioning with it? We start connecting with source, utilizing it, no matter what religious system that we're in. We start functioning in groups. We start participating in group rituals, singing, dancing again, communicating with each other again, sharing information, just like in that study that I showed you guys. The benefit is that certain governmental systems will be forced to make room for that kind of behavior to take place. And it would not be like in the 70s. If we go and we maintain an organized structure, just like in Aztec societies of the past, an organized structure could give credibility to what it is that we're doing so such that science and engineering and mathematics progress leaps and bounds beyond where we're currently at due to communion with other races and other species of human beings and other galaxies where the mushroom is being consumed and where we're able to communicate with our brothers and sisters in other planes of existence. So what does it mean to travel to the underworld to gather the bones from the age previous and initiate a process of rebirthing humanity? This was Quetzalcoatl's mission to Mikli. 
When Quetzalcoatl first journeyed to the underworld, his job was to go and gather the bones from the previous age and initiate a process of rebirth. And you can look this up. So here's the journey of the deified heart. This shows Quetzalcoatl eating the, the psilocybin mushroom right here, pointing up at the underworld, conquering his fear of death. Here's death right here with a skull with blood dripping out of his mouth. This is the Mayan Codex. This is a technology to use on the mushroom. These are all the different races and alien species that also eat mushrooms that are friendly, that he communes with here. And this is from the Aztec philosophy book and also Tom Lane's book, uh, Sacred Mushroom uh, Ceremonies and Rituals. And at this point, Quetzalcoatl goes through cleaning his, his life up, basically. Goes through the lake of fire, where he's tested on every form. His feet are dangling up in the air. He's got to go through cleaning up his, his disorganized life. And when he makes it through that death, he is reborn as a two-faced Quetzalcoatl with the eagle warrior insignia, looking at past and present at the same time as a seer. When I hear Baba Kalindi Ee's name, I know that his last name, Ee, means he is an oracle and a seer of epic proportions. And I know that when you go through the full process of the mushroom, by the time you get to the end of it, you should have the ability to stand on a fixed point in time, a few past, present, and future all at the same time as one event. That way you are not living in the past. Like my mother says, we're living in the present, in the now. Well, they've slowed down. I have very special parents. I called them on the peak of my last mushroom trip. I said, how's it going? How are you guys doing? I would never do that before. But I looked at my mom and I realized that she puts so much love into what she's doing before she ever formulates the idea to do it. She might go into a store and buy some paint. She's already put so much research into the kind of paint that she wants and the kind of way it's supposed to look. You know, it's the love and energy that you put into something when you're living in the moment, when you're living in a single point, when you're not so focused on the future that you're focused on the here and now. And it's interesting because my dad says a little bit different. He says, occasionally when somebody asks you where you're from, tell them you're from the future. I was like, Dad, are you serious? He was like, yeah, tell them that you're from the future. And my dad's a very serious person. Now I had to think to myself, is that true? So I went on mushrooms about it. Go ahead and look around it. And realize that the probability of you being in this timeline is extremely rare to be doing this work. A lot of us were sent here from other realities. And we chose to be here to do specific kind of work. And it's time to start taking accountability for that work that we came here to do. And I want to be the first person to say, I'm about to take accountability. So when the mushroom was originally consumed, the jaguar warriors at the eagle's nest, these warriors didn't just receive the jaguar overnight. This was a sign of royalty. You receive this as a great honor of going into the mushroom and going through your full rites of passage, conquering your mundane fear so you're not at home trying to protect your wife and kids from something that's not even going to happen yet. You're not double-minded. Once that non-duality set in and they were able to transform themselves into the jaguar and absorb the spirit of the animal, they wore the jaguar skins in order to absorb special cities from the animal or spiritual abilities. These cities include heightened hearing, wearing the ears of the cat, heightened sight, wearing the eyes of the cat on their head, heightened uh, ferocity and wrathfulness when they would uh, uh, be able to capture an, uh, an enemy. When an Aztec warrior would capture an enemy, he was a sponge of power. This jaguar warrior would keep the enemy in good shape because he was seen as a tonality. A tonality is a container of sacred energy. So even when they capture their, in, their, their enemies, they would cut off the top knot of hair from the top of the enemy's head and then keep it in their medicine bag and utilize the energy later. It was seen as a power source. 
and the whole person's body, from the blood to their bones, were seen as a power source. So the energy and motion translates to monosynactic movement as well. If you're a warrior and you're eating the mushroom and you're going to train, then a monosynaptic movement, one synapse. You don't think before you strike. You strike with your full power in a relaxed state because you're not preparing or thinking about it. You didn't slow down to even think. You just strike. And you strike at lightning speed like a jaguar on the plains. So we gotta change the balance, uh, the bias, or challenge the bias against those who use psilocybin. And that's a param uh, paramount. You ever seen Ip Man? IP Man? Ip Man 4? Remember what he, he told the daughter of the Grand Master? He said, we don't have to agree to fight together. We don't have to have the same martial art to fight bias. And after you get through the point of healing yourself, then comes the activism aspect of fighting the bias of those who see psilocybin as something that doesn't have a history, a foundation, that the people who worked with the mushroom aren't still around. Fight bias. And then learn how to use the technologies that are available at your disposal. We have one of the greatest technologies I've ever seen. And I've seen some pretty amazing technologies. If I'm saying that the Palantir Stone is a greater technology than what I saw as a 5,000 year old artifact that was a baby's rattle to help educate the youth of an entire civilization, that's pretty high level technology. But when Kalindi said it's a Palantir, I don't think some of y'all read Lord of the Rings. How many of y'all read Lord of the Rings? How many nerds we got in here? One? When he said Palantir, you guys were like, oh, that's catchy. So when we say Palantir, and you watch the movie Lord of the Rings, Sauron would say things like, do you think the eyes of the White Tower are blind? We have technologies to see what is going on in this community, and we're not ignorant to it. There's a lot of things that we've seen. A lot of families have suffered since COVID happened. Some of the families suffered because there was a lot going on behind the scenes, spiritually as well. As, some, as one elder said, we are and have been in a spiritual war, at least since I got to this planet. I'm only 27. My elder, Bob Colby, talked about this spiritual war quite a lot. So the Palantir was used by the heirs of Elendil, as well as those appointed to guard them. This is Lord of the Rings lore. The stones responded to the best of those with the right to use them. Hence, Denethor's ability to utilize the stone of the White City easily, whereas Saruman struggled with its use. Baba Glendy said that Palantir stones for the family. When he says for the family, he's referring to those who have the right to use the stone. Those who have the right to use the stone were trained with certain crystals, or the transdimensional crystals, and have the seer ability. They are seers and oracles in training, as he described. And the Palantir is designed as a tool that people can use when under the influence of the sacred mushroom to open up light ships and to travel to other dimensions and bring back information about the past and the future so we as a community can make better decisions. That's why the Palantir is here in this room. The Palantir has a long history. And if you read about it, you can just look it up in the name. He put the information out here for you guys. The stone had permanent poles aligned with the center of the earth. This is the reason why it works. With permanent upper and nether poles, the circumfer uh, circumferential faces were the ones that allowed viewing, receiving outside visions, and channeling them to the eye of the beholder on the opposite side. If one wished to look east, he would place himself on the western side of that were, unlike the master stones, which could rotate and look in any direction. When I took 21 dry grams and I was in Baba Kalindi's basement, that stone turned itself inside the stone and a giant eye appeared that was the size of the whole stone to look into my soul and to determine my worthiness. And had I not answered his questions honestly, 
and to the best of my ability, it would not have opened up its knowledge or would it not have revealed itself as not being a stationary stone, but an intelligence that is conscious and sentient and alive. Using a palantir required a person with great strength of will and wisdom. The palantir I were meant to be used by the Dunedain to communicate and gain information throughout the realms of exile. And I know a few of you guys think of this planet that we're on right now as kind of a realm of exile. So I think it's funny how they put this in a book that is a fictional book, but it's based on psychedelic experiences. This wasn't just put here by accident. The stones responded best to those with the right to use them. The kings themselves or their appointed students or wardens would use it. And use the stone. All right, so thank you for attending and listening. Do you guys have any questions? I'm happy to answer them. There's no tradition on the planet that I can find 
where dried mushrooms are actually part of the tradition. So I think part of the problem is when we take 15 and 20 dry grams, we're just getting to a threshold level of what the mushroom is like fresh and municipalities like Sierra Madre region. You can eat three mushrooms and get to like a 20 or 30 gram level. And I've repeated this experience multiple times and talked to many elders who have been eating the mushroom for 21 plus years fresh and dried and we all make the same consensus. Fresh is stronger and it tastes better and it's easier on the body, especially when it's chewed with a specific kind of honey. So for people who are going in at that level and going to that lake, I would say if you are having difficulty getting there with dried mushrooms, try fresh. Because the color and the depth to which you will observe yourself going through these processes is much stronger. It's almost like being accosted by the multiverse and then being taken apart cell and molecule by molecule at a fresh level. Whereas at a dry level, you might see the colors, but you don't feel the physical grip of the mushroom that has on you. So you don't even really know what you experience outside of seeing something beautiful, which is not a bad thing. But if you really want to have those deep, profound spiritual experiences, perhaps you should do what the ancients were also doing as well. is heavily cultivated at home. So I went to two different uh, stingless wasp uh, honey producers in Baltuco, Mexico, and actually stayed there. I actually brought some back with me that I'll have available tomorrow. But the stingless wasp honey was originally on the Mayan Codice. If I go and I back up to the Mayan Codice, let me go ahead and back up right here. So you see this little picture, picture right here? This is the Mayan stingless wasp right here. There's Melipona honey and Miel de Castilla, and both are two different things. If you see brown Miel de Castilla, it's not the same because it's been sitting either a year or two or it's a different species of stingless wasps. There's stingless bees and there's stingless wasps. All right, and both produce honey. One's a slightly greenish, light-colored honey, one's slightly brown. That's how you can tell the difference. The greenish one is used for the eyes primarily, so is the slightly brown one. They're both very viscous. They're not uh, thick like regular honey. They're kind of watery, but they're very uniform. The mushroom was traditionally eaten after you ate one, two, three, four, five mushrooms. Then you would go and get your honey and start chewing. I like to chew the whole time until there's nothing left in my mouth because the psilocybin is carried by the glucose, the psilocin specifically, once it's broken down by citric acid in this honey, it tastes a little citrusy. It tastes a little bit citrusy because it has citric acid in it that breaks down psilocybin and the psilocin in your mouth, not in your liver, and the glucose from the honey carries the psilocybin directly through the mucal membrane under your tongue and, and at the top of your mouth and through your cheeks. So you start feeling uh, the energy right in your face as soon as you keep chewing the mushroom fresh and it starts to dissolve until there's nothing left. And then that's when you shape shift into the jaguar. That's when you shape shift into Quetzalcoatl. That's when you have these novel experiences of being physiologically changed is when the psilocybin is absorbing through your gums and through the top of the roof of your mouth because that's where the medicine is. So that's where you feel it the most first, which is why you don't see too many jaguar warriors with you know, on all fours, because the head is what feels the experience. Quetzalcoatl goes from this rather uh, 